Welcome, I'm Matthew Phelps, co-author of the Turning to God's Word Bible Study, The United Kingdom of Israel, Foreshadowing the Reign of Christ the King. Today we'll be talking about Lesson 26 of our study, which covers the first book of Kings, Chapter 8. So, the temple is done, but we have not yet gotten it set up as a place of worship. There are a couple things we've got to do first. Most importantly, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, which is not yet in the temple, has to be put in the temple. And then there is also a long tradition of dedication in such uh, situations. So we'll, we will also want to dedicate the temple. So Solomon calls together all of the elders, and he gets some priests to help him move the Ark. And he gets a whole bunch of animals to sacrifice, which is pretty much the game plan, as we've seen before. And they carry the Ark up into the area of the New Temple. Uh, there is a really interesting contrast here uh, between Solomon carrying the Ark up with his whole procession and his sacrifices, and when David brought the Ark into the city uh, previously. Uh, and we see so much of the game plan is the same. You get a whole bunch of people around, you sacrifice a bunch of animals, uh, you have a big celebration, uh, but there's a point of contrast. We see when David brings the ark up into the city, he is filled with joy and dancing before the processional wearing an ephod. Uh, and he's really into it, like celebrating and rejoicing at the presence of God. Whereas we don't hear what Solomon was doing, but it feels like much more of a mechanical, like these are just the steps we take thing with Solomon, whereas David it seemed like he couldn't possibly want to do anything on earth more than what he was doing. Uh, interesting contrast shows kind of difference between David and Solomon here a little bit, but he's bringing it up, he's got everybody assembled, uh, he is killing countless animals in sacrifice, he's checking all the boxes in terms of this is what you do, but you know, sometimes that's not all that God wants from us. Uh, it's so easy to live our lives and say, well, you know, I didn't do these bad things. I'm doing fine. Check, check, check. I've met, like, the basic structure of rules. But in case it's not clear enough here, Jesus is very adamant that for us as Christians, the way that this works is not you have to follow these specific rules and you're good. It's you have to love God and you have to love your neighbors and it's that and there's no just checkbox that says I loved my neighbor enough today so I can now I can be fine. Uh, it's a constant and an ongoing thing and it matters less what you do is why and how you do it. Um, and I think Solomon's bringing of the ark up into the temple is a perfect example of how you can do the right things and maybe still miss the point a little bit. We'll see how that develops uh, throughout his dedication, which I think will continue the theme of missing the point just a little bit. So now we see a little bit about the Ark. Uh, specifically, in this context, it is described as containing only the tablets of the law, whereas in the letter to the Hebrews, uh, it is described as containing the tablets of the law, the staff of Aaron, and manna from the desert. Um, interesting couple different points there. I think the authors in both cases are making different points about what the Ark is and what's important about it, which would explain some of the discrepancy. We're not saying either of them is necessarily wrong, even if there are contradictory points. Uh, I think it's best to look at 
what are what is the author trying to say about the purpose and importance of the ark uh, in hebrews it's being used as a type of mary who contained jesus who was priest staff of aaron giver of the new law tablets and bread from heaven uh the manna so the letter of the hebrews is making a very christological point this is all about jesus whereas here it is this is the covenant that we had which is summed up in these tablets and the law and so this is for these people at this time their relationship with god was this law this is the sum total and the important thing about our relationship with god is this law and we'll see that develop here a little bit more in a bit uh, so and then the ark is placed in the house of god and what happens the same thing that used to happen when it was in the set up tent or tabernacle a cloud fills the space uh, which is the glory of the lord so whatever you might say we might say about Solomon's exact intentions and some of the stuff going on here, God has chosen to come and dwell in this house. Uh, he's giving it a shot. Uh, and that was a thing that tended to happen and to follow around where the ark was. But in terms of God's living situation, there is a fundamental shift that's happened here that we want to make sure to emphasize. Uh, the temple's not really the same fundamentally in terms of what it means for God's relationship with his people as the tabernacle was. Um, with a tent that travels, the intention was to show by his presence that God was always traveling with his people, but of course was not contained to any space. Uh, but was just, yeah, I'm traveling around, I'm making you all travel around with tents, I'm going to do it with you. Uh, and was kind of a just, yeah, I'm here, but of course I'm not just here. Which Solomon sort of acknowledges throughout the course of this. God can't be contained in the temple, and he's everywhere, but then we're going to take him and try to cram him in this spot, too. Uh, and there, it's more of a because it's a fixed place, it's more of a, it's less of a God is living with us and more of a we're going to confine him to this spot so he doesn't have to be in all the rest of our lives. Uh, which again is, I think, a thing very tempting for us to do as Christians as well, whether it be a time or a place. God can have 10 o'clock on Sunday when I go to Mass uh, and then I'll take other times and that's fine because we've just taken God being with me always and everywhere, and we have, by creating a separate space or time, I'll just cram him in there, and he won't be everywhere else then, which is a little bit of the implication of what's going on here with this house of God, and it's very much not what God wants or what we want to do. We have to keep the idea of God traveling with us and being with us everywhere. Um, and if the people do that, they'll be fine, but there is a strong possibility having God centered on one fixed location that you can start losing touch with being the people of God who is with you everywhere you go. So, we've got the Ark in the temple now. God's glory has come down. Uh, so he seems to have he seems to have agreed at least initially with the premise of this whole thing, or he's at least going along. And now it is speech time um, from Solomon. Throughout all of this, uh, as we continue through with this speech, an interesting point to think about is what authority does Solomon actually have as king to enter into this kind of arrangement where he seems to be changing the way God relates to his people. Does the king have the authority to do that? He's certainly talking about it like he's made a fundamental change here, but has he and can he? Uh, are interesting questions here and moving forward. And spoiler alert, no. No, he has not, and no, he cannot. So there is a certain amount of presumption that underlies this whole thing. Uh, and that brings us to a point, Solomon being 
the wisest person ever, not, well, slight exaggeration, but certainly the wisest person of his day, uh, and known for his wisdom, how can he be missing the point behind who God is and what he's doing? Like, he's going along mostly right, but kind of missing the fundamental point of everything. How can he be doing that when David, who is not as wise as he is, did not miss the point? Uh, and the answer is, wisdom is not the most important thing to God, as it turns out. David had a humility that Solomon doesn't, and that allowed him to see God as he is and what he was doing as it was in a way that no amount of wisdom can. So we'll see Solomon, very wise, able to grasp a lot of the details of what's going on, but he misses where God's heart is in everything because of that lack of humility. So, once he gets it set up, he, we see some of his agenda. He, the, his speech starts with the theme of, I have fulfilled the promise that God made to my father David, and look at me, king, forever, glorious line, everything's been done, we've got the house, so now we've, he, and God is dwelling in it, so he's blessed all of this, and it's fine, everything is great, uh, is the major opening point of his speech. But he does slip in one other line that I think shows fundamentally how much he's missing the point and foreshadows even more of what is to come, which is in verse 21, uh, he describes the covenant being in the ark, and he's talking about the tablets of the law. The written law is not the covenant. The following of it is the covenant, and he seems to have replaced the doing with the describing as the covenant. Uh, which is, which I do think highlights, it's one thing to understand right from wrong, and that is an important thing for all of us to do, uh, and for him to do. Uh, but where we relate to God is not in the knowing, but it is in the doing. Uh, the covenant is what we do, not what we know. Uh, and therein lies potentially Solomon's fatal flaw. So here as we're winding down on the first section of his speech, we see he really drives home again, and I am the fulfillment of course, and God, you'll agree and keep doing this, of the promises you made to David. Uh, it really does seem to be, if you're giving a big political speech, you're definitely going to open with one of the most key points to you that you want to make. And it's not... Lord, let your glory be established on earth through forever through this temple and bless all the peoples of the world. It's, and now, for me, you're going to do all the stuff that you promised my father David, and it's going to come, and it's clearly coming about through me because here is the temple. Uh, that seems, this section, the speech to me highlights the idea that that is Solomon's fundamental motivation in building the temple. I think here, at the beginning, Solomon makes potentially the first really good point that he has made in the entirety of this dedication, which is, God, of course, all of creation can't contain you, so for real, we know that this temple that we want you to live in is not going to contain you. Uh, for real, we know that, but so now that we've acknowledged that, Let's move that point off to the side, and then whenever your people cry out or pray to you or make supplication, let it be directed at this temple and then hear them. Uh, if you think about it, where and how before did people make supplication to the Lord? Uh, if you were lucky enough to be the king, usually you had a prophet around that you could talk to to help you out with that. But it was never tied, in that case, it wasn't tied to a place at all. It was tied to the holiness of the people doing it. You want to get God's attention and get him on your side, you find the holiest person you can and have that person talk to God for you. Um, and it's about a holy person and not a holy place, which again, I think, highlights this idea of what Solomon thinks the covenant is and what it is. It's not the description of the law, it's the following. It's not a place you build for God, it's someone doing what God wants done. Uh, 
But again, Solomon having acknowledged, God, you're huge and everywhere, is then saying, but yeah, let's focus everything on the temple, which is not just Solomon being a bad guy. There's a lot of very good reason religiously and politically, mostly political religiously, for why he's doing this. We saw again uh, at the beginning of his reign, people were worshiping all over the place, had no idea what to do. There will, it really was no standardized, consistent religious practice. And it's not a bad thing that he's doing that. Uh, it, was, it was even probably desperately needed. Uh, but some of the assumptions he's making and how he's doing it are potentially not 100% correct. And so we're building here into Jerusalem a structure of a religious structure that will create problems when Solomon's gone uh, to the point that it will be one of the causes of the fracturing of the kingdom uh, is the idea that can God be in a single place and do we all have to worship him there uh, versus can't we worship God uh, like we did before where he was everywhere and we focus on being holy and it creates not saying that he is necessarily wrong because the ark is also there, but he has shifted the focus a little bit away from the loving and serving God and a little bit more toward the what. And that does lead to some division later. Uh, but at any rate, we have a central point of worship now, and that does have significant upsides as well. And we see even into the days of Jesus that there are three times a year where all good Jews go to Jerusalem to worship. Uh, the precedent that is being set here is a precedent that is suggested from back in the Torah and that continues through the time of Jesus. So continuing on the theme we've been talking about here, we see Solomon go through a list of, hey, remember all these times you used to want God's attention? Now, if you just come to the temple, God, please listen to people there. Uh, when they bring any of their supplications, cries for help, military problems, any of the things we used to find a holy person to talk to God on our behalf for. Now, let's just come to the temple and God, why don't you listen to us there? by virtue of the place, and again, not by virtue of the holiness of the person. Um, he's, it's, he's expanding on that idea and asking God to bless and to ratify and make that the thing. But again, as we talked about a little earlier in this lesson, he doesn't have the authority to do that. God is not saying, yes, Solomon, I agree. We're going to care more about the place of the temple than we do the holiness of the people. Uh, it's Solomon saying, hey, everybody and God, let's do this. And God is not, there's no new covenant here. God has not changed how this works and said, yeah, I really, you know, I've been, everything I've been doing up till now has been, you know, I'm with you wherever you go. And I care about how you live your lives, not about sacrifice or stuff or any of that. And I've been wrong all this time. And I really just wanted to live in a place where you could come find me. You're so right, Solomon. Let's do it that way. That's not really happening. It's just, this is Solomon's idea of how this is going to work, which is not 100% what God has in mind. In this section, we do get an interesting addition, uh, which is, it's a thing that we can lose sight of was a call of the people of Israel, which is they were supposed to bless all the nations. Uh, now Solomon is talking about another thing with the temple. Well, when have it so when foreigners come to the temple, because of course they will, because God, your glory is so great and wonderful. Everybody will want to come uh, and pay tribute to you and get to know you in your temple. Answer their prayers too when they come here uh, and visit this temple. Uh, on the surface, this one looks better, but if you think about it in terms of getting to know God, do you really get to know God and a beautiful architecture can help, right? We have great, beautiful churches today, uh, Catholic churches, and they can help raise our soul to God. But, and it can be 
a wonderful invitation to get to know God. But it is not the place that grants prayers. Uh, it is God. Uh, and even when he lives in those churches, the idea in the form of the Eucharist, the idea is to get to know God, not to get to know the place. And so even for people coming to learn about and to pay tribute to God, it would be nice if they could have something that allowed them to get to know God rather than, again, it is a place where he's living. There's a cloud there. It would be magnificent. It would be wonderful. It could help foreigners fear, fear the Lord. This is not an entirely bad idea, but for really getting to know the Lord and to spread his blessing to everywhere, you'd think there'd be a better system. Specifically, couldn't people go out to the other people instead of having them come to you? You have peace on all sides. Your kingdom is thriving and prospering. Do you need to have people come to you, or could you go out and maybe do a little bit of work among them as well? But if you're not really trying to be a blessing to all the nations, but are a lot more focused on you and what your kingdom and your people are doing, that would not be a priority. So now Solomon is a little bit prophetic in what he talks about. So God, of course, everybody sins, and we're going to sin, and when we do that, then again, and you're angry again, let's just pray in or if we're in exile somehow toward this temple, uh, and then you, will, you should hear our prayers toward Jerusalem and the temple. Then you should just hear our prayers and make everything okay as long as we're sorry and we mean it. Uh, decent point. He's foreseeing that there might be still cause for God to get angry. Uh, with the people and that there could be bad consequences. But he exposes the largest fatal flaw in his temple plan here, uh, which is if you're in exile and the temple and the city have been utterly destroyed, then what are you supposed to pray to? If this whole thing had been established as he's going for, then if the people for some odd reason were to be entirely exiled and Jerusalem destroyed, then they have no recourse. They have no way to make amends with God if the temple is the place and the thing you do. Uh, and of course the people are exiled and God does have mercy on them and allow them back to rebuild the city and the temple, uh, which is great, but it's the relationship with God works without the temple. Uh, Solomon did not bind the fate of the people and their relationship with God to the temple. God is with his people no matter what, uh, and will hear them in exile, temple or no. Uh, and that is a very comforting thought, I think, to us as well as Christians, is God is with us wherever we are and can hear our prayers uh, even in our sin and our failings, God can hear us ask for mercy and for forgiveness and can hear and grant that. Now, now for the second time, we see Solomon make a really excellent point here, uh, which is as he's rounding about, he calls back to God be with us always so long as we keep your commands, statutes, ordinances, uh, coming back to the idea of you can build a house for God to dwell in and he can temporarily agree that his presence will be there, but God is not going to dwell with you as people if you aren't following and serving God. Uh, and so excellent point on his part uh, and the most understanding point that he makes in the speech is that, yes, God, please dwell with us, but yeah, we get it. If we don't follow your rules, that's going to be hard. You'll do it as long as we do. So he kind of rounds around to the right point in the end. Uh, it just takes a while to get there. So now at the conclusion of his speech, we see lots and lots of sacrifices are offered in this whole dedication period, and it's not just one day. They do it for a period of seven days. They have a big festival feast, uh, kind of a big party, uh, and everybody acknowledges and celebrates the dedication of the new temple. And with that, it is dedicated. Uh, we have a central worship point, and we're going to start using the temple. 
This has been an overview of Lesson 26 of the Turning to God's Word Bible Study, The United Kingdom of Israel, Foreshadowing the Reign of Christ the King. For more information, consult our written study and visit us online at turningtogodsword.com.